Greetings everyone, I want to talk about a crucial part of IFR flight planning, that being standard instrument departures, also known as SIDS, and standard terminal arrival routes known as STARS. Now, SIDS and STARS are predetermined routes with speed and altitude restrictions that will guide you to and from the airport. Most airports have multiple published SIDS and STARS, each one is uh, set up to accommodate the direction you're departing and arriving. Now there are two different kinds of published charts, one being from the National Aeronautical Chart Office, and then there's Jeppesen charts. And now they have subtle differences in layout, but are based on the same idea and legend. And if you'd like to learn more about the differences between the two, there's a great article over at thinkaviation.net, and I'll link that in the description. So typically air traffic control will instruct you to climb or descend via the sitter star, but there are situations where ATC will cancel certain procedures while flying a departure or approach. They might have you skip a few waypoints and send you direct or cancel speed and altitude restrictions, so don't be caught off guard if this happens. One of my favorite sources for charts is airnav.com, and this website covers the US and its territories. From the home page, click the airport tab and then type in the airport code of your choosing and you'll be taken to the airport page for that specific airport. And if you scroll to the bottom, you'll see the SIDS and STARS there. and. Um, that's where you can get them. They're just PDF files. You can download them, print them, do whatever you wish. Now, the next popular source you can use for charts is Navigraph.com. And this is a subscription-based source with uh, both U.S. and uh, charts from around the world. So, remember, you go there. This, uh, this does cost uh, a monthly fee, so you should know that before going into it. Now, the last thing to cover before we talk about the charts themselves is how do you know which SID and star to use for your route? Now there are several sources to get routes, the most complete source being simbrief.com and this is a free website that does require you to set up an account and once your account is made you can easily plug in your departure and arrival and from there simbrief will instantly build a route for you. It also provides several alternative routes if you wish to use one different from the main selection. Now another free and easy to use source is flightaware.com. This website is a live real world flight tracker. And here you simply type in the departure and arrival and you will be taken to a page that lists all the airlines that run that particular route. After picking the airline, you'll be taken to a specific page for that flight and there it'll show you the full route that the airline filed with the uh, cruising altitude and, and the only downside to this is that it only works for flights in the US or flights that are traveling to or from the US. Uh, anything international other than the US doesn't uh, populate the route. So now that you know where to find SID and STAR charts, we'll talk about understanding the charts themselves. Each SID and STAR has a unique name given to them, and these names might abbreviate pop culture terms, sports teams, or points of interest in the area, among other things. As you can see with the list of SIDs in Atlanta, two referencing the movie The Lord of the Rings with Gandalf 2 and Hobbit 2. And you can also see another two that reference the movie Star Wars with Jedi 2 and Sith 2 on the following page. Now the number you see next to the SID and STAR represents how many times the chart has been amended. The next time the SIF 2 departure is updated it will become the SIF 3. And after 10 amendments the count goes back down to 1. Let's take a look at a SID out of San Diego International Airport. This SID is called the Zoo 2, referencing the local San Diego Zoo. The transition we will use is Mount Baldy. The first thing to look at is the departure route description located on the upper left. This description will clearly spell out all of the procedures that you need to follow. If an airport has multiple runways, you will see different sets of instructions for each runway. Some SIDs are meant for just one side of the runway, while other SIDs will include instructions for both ends of the runway. For the Zoo 2, we only have instructions for a runway 27 departure. Upon takeoff, we'll climb with a heading of 275 at 500 feet per nautical mile to reach 520 feet, then crossing the jetty waypoint at or below flight level 120 and not exceeding a speed of 230 knots. The line above the altitude lets you know that this is a cross at or below point. If the line was under the altitude, it would mean cross at or above, and two lines means you must cross at the published altitude. The last thing to note about Jetty is the waypoint symbol with a circle around it. This is called a flyover point. This means you must fly over this point before making the turn. Flyover waypoints can be in place to avoid obstacles or to comply with noise abatement. The other waypoint symbols are called flyby points. These points are a little more lenient when making turns as you're not held to flying precisely over them, hence the name flyby. 
After crossing the zoo waypoint, we have our first transition option. A transition connects you with the rest of your flight plan. At this point, flying the Sid or Star is over. If Senza was our transition, we would track a heading of 099. The departure description gives one last instruction that if we're a turbojet, we won't fly higher than flight level 230 while on the transition. And if we're a turboprop, this altitude restriction is flight level 150. This altitude hold won't be for long as we'll eventually be cleared up to our filed altitude. If our transition is Imperial or Mont Baldy, instead of flying to Senza, we'll proceed to George at 14,000 feet, heading 085, and from there flying a heading of 066 to Grinder. At this point, you're connected with the other two transition options for the SID. Heading 072 will put you on the route for the IPL transition, and heading 011 will put you on the Mount Baldy transition. Now that we know the three different directions this route can take us, we'll look at the notes on the middle left. Now the first note is telling us that our aircraft needs to be equipped with radar. RNAV-1 is saying your aircraft needs a navigation system that's accurate within one nautical mile 95% of the time. And if it were to say RNAV-2, the same applies except it's two miles of being correct 95% of the time. The next note is requiring a DME slash IRU capable aircraft or GPS system on board. Next, you're being informed that some aircraft may be vectored to the three waypoints after flying the downwind. This means ATC will tell you what heading to fly to reach the waypoints rather than following the SID. The next note is telling you to advise ATC if you cannot meet altitude restriction of 14,000 feet at George. This ties into the next note that mentions parachute jumping is going on at all hours of the day at uh, 13,005 and near George. And lastly, you're being told if your aircraft is not equipped with GPS and you're using Mount Baldy, that the PGY DME must be operating. Last piece of information to discuss is the upper right of the SID, and here you will find all the useful frequencies of the area. This includes ATIS, clearance delivery, ground, Lindbergh, tower, and SoCal departure. Now please note if you're flying online with VATSIM or, or a service like that, some or all these frequencies might be different from the real world frequencies, so be paying attention to what the actual frequency is. After going over the SID, let's take a look at the star. The star we're using is called the Eldora 2. For this arrival, there are three transitions we can use to answer the star. These are Blue Mesa, Brazo, and O-Ray. These three transition waypoints will lead you to freeze. You'll notice the Blue Mesa transition has a maximum altitude restriction, MAA, of flight level 260. This means you cannot fly above that altitude. From freeze, track a heading of 037 for peak, then it's on to Eldora at flight level 130, and a speed restriction of 210 knots. Remember, this is a flyover point because of the symbol that's being used. From there, fly a heading of 064, and ATC will vector you the rest of the way to the runway. And if you lose communication with ATC, you are told to fly an ILS approach for runway 35 left. The route we're flying requires the URE transition, which has us track a 036 heading to freeze. Once you reach URE, you'll notice an oval shape at the next waypoint, Canosa. You can see the same shape at HBU, freeze, and peak. These are points where you can enter a holding pattern if needed. This might be done to create separation between aircraft, or if you're too high on the descent. This holding pattern allows for the issue to be corrected before moving on. We should cross freeze at or below flight level 200 as indicated by the line below flight level 200. Continue the 037 heading to Larks where we need to cross at or above 17,000 or at or below flight level 190 and slow to 250 knots. You also notice a triangle symbol at this point. This is a non-compulsory reporting point. You are not required to report to ATC at this point unless told to. If the triangle was solid, this is a compulsory reporting point, and you would be required to report to ATC. After Larks, it's on to Eldora, where we need to cross at an altitude of 13,210 knots, indicated by the line above and below the restriction. Remember, Eldora is also a flyover point. This means you must hit this waypoint. After Eldora, you will be vectored to the active runway. The last thing we'll look at is the notes. The first three notes are similar to the SID. Radar is required. This is an RNAV-1 approach, and a DME, IRU, or GPS is required to proceed. Now, this star is also for turbojet aircraft only. 
Once you contact Denver on Tracon, you can expect your runway assignment. Expect Peak when Denver is landing south as there is another star named Peak 3. And descend via mock speed until reaching the transition. At this time, your descent should be 280 knots until ATC instructs you to lower your speed. If your aircraft is not equipped with GPS and you're using the Brazo transition, the ALS, RSK, and Pub DMEs need to be operational. And if you're using the Blue Mesa transition without GPS, the HPU DME must be operating. After completing the star, it's on to the final phase of flight, which is the approach plate. Now, these plates are what guide you down to the runway. And because there's a lot to talk about with these approach plates, I wanted to include it in this video, but it's so much more that it really deserves its own video. So that'll be the subject of the next tutorial. I really hope these examples have given you a good foundation to build on. Now, most modern jets will do a lot of the work for you through the VNAV system and your uh, FMS, but you can take what you've learned here, continue to study, look for other sources. I'll, I'll include some in the description, good ones for you to read up, and then, you know, study that up and continue to grow. So I hope this helped you guys out and you uh, have a better, a better idea of what um, SIDS and STARS are now, and you can just go forward from there. So... Alright everybody, I want to thank you for watching. You take care, and I'll see you next time.